Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Great to see you today. It's almost summer. We're almost there. Now that we're into May, don't you think that we get to take Fridays off? I think that is how we should all roll. I know in my Chicago days, definitely we had so few good summer days that, boy, once May hit, forget it. You could not find anybody in the office on a Friday, uh, Friday afternoon. And then that became just all Friday, which of course works for all of us. So I hope you are all gathering into that mindset. I've been on the road, like always doing lots of public speaking, March and April were pure madness. And I was doing a lot of plant-based business hours from the road, but I am back in studio now. And I'm thinking about all that I learned on the road. Basically, how do we move food systems transformation forward? Clearly, it's going to take all hands on deck. I talk a lot about blended capital. You guys know what that is by now, the term being government money, philanthropic money, venture capital money, and Wall Street money. That's what I do with Dr. Sasha Goodman at VegTech Invest. All of these things coming together. When you want to shift something as large as the global food supply system, that's a $9.4 trillion industry. Some call it a $16 trillion industry. Obviously, that doesn't move overnight. So to build that infrastructure. It's going to take time. But is that enough? Is it just money? Money's good. Don't get me wrong. Money's good. But is it just money? Maybe there's more that can be done. That's why today I wanted to bring on my guest, Dr. Sasha Goodman, who is the Chief Investment Officer of VegTech Invest. Apparently, and maybe you've seen it on our social media, VegTech Invest has a new white paper out. It is a white paper done with Harvard students, Harvard students from the Great Food Systems Transformation course. It is a white paper on stakeholder engagement in plant-based innovation and diversified proteins. Dr. Sasha Goodman, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Okay, so... There's a paper now on uh, stakeholder engagement, plant-based innovation, and diversified proteins. Done this in collaboration. You really spearheaded it with five Harvard students. Why this paper and what kind of impact can it have? Well, uh, so the paper outlines strategies for pushing organizations towards protein diversification and plant-based innovation. So, um, you know, that was the goal, first of all. I mean, I just think that I mean, that's that was the main goal, and it was really a undertaking because um, you know uh, it's a very complicated area. So we made it easy to read. Uh, I think that that's if you don't take out anything else from this talk, this is an easy to read paper. I think with clear headings, uh, takeaways, um, making it easy for, for diverse audiences to read, and it includes practical uh, advice as well. So. So to get to your question, like, what is the significance? Like, why even do this? Um, what's the motivation? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so there was a real gap in the literature, <laughs> to say it lightly. This paper fills this gap. Um, there's no strategic advocacy literature within the plant-based innovation sector in particular. Uh, there was no comprehensive guide. Um, there were there was there were other things scattered around that weren't related to this. And so this um really supports our mission which is not only to invest uh but to engage with uh plant-based food and material companies to foster further innovation growth in the sector protein diversification and we needed a, a blueprint we needed a blueprint for ourselves for others so this this blueprint not only you know goes through the justification scientific backing it acts as a blueprint for engaging with these companies effectively uh, and uh, that's what we did. Yeah, it's wonderful. You use the word guide, and I'm going to pick up on that in just a second. But um, it, in addition to talking about the white space for the white paper, so there was no guidebook or blueprint for stakeholder engagement for this sector of sustainable food systems transformation. So you felt that it was necessary to have a guidebook of how to engage companies to include more diversified proteins. And what's the rationale to the companies? Why should they include more diversified proteins? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, it has to be explained to them in a way that makes sense. And that's the bottom line, you know, um, to put it bluntly. I mean, uh, you know, companies like money, um, you know, investors like them to make money. 
So uh, and and as the board and the boards like them to make everybody likes them uh, to make money. So you're coming in with people in that mindset. So it's really important to frame things in a way that they understand that they'll understand. So um, so it's really important, like as people outside wanting um, to influence them, if we don't put it in terms that they can understand, someone else will, like their vendors, well, they're like, well, their legacy vendors will continue to offer them good deals, I don't know, to continue what they were doing before. So what we need to do is say, well, you know, there's a market, say, for you outside that you might want to, uh, that we think that you need to be part of this uh, long-term trend. If you don't, there's risks, there's environmental risks, there's climate risks, uh, there are risks to your stakeholders, which are um, sometimes, um, you know, environmental ones. You don't want to be polluting your stakeholders' air, you know, with, you know, your investors' air, you're flooding their waters. So, so I think that um, effective advocacy um, is is meant to uh, basically translate what we want into something that you know uh, that that they want and we all want as well. It's just it's just a, a communication issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to kind of wrap that up in a bow, I, I'm an editor on the paper, so of course it's very uh, I'm very close to it. So. Um, Everyone in the system wants to make money, and I'll say everyone at VegTech Invest does as well. So, knowing that we that that's the goal, uh, we try to frame why diversified proteins would help a company make more money. And indeed, when you see a more efficient technology, you use it. When you see a technology or a diversified supply chain that adds resiliency to the food system and therefore saves money, you do it. When you see that it reduces risks for environmental environmental damage or um, fines coming from polluting water sources and land sources and manure pits, things like this. These are all financial risks to the bottom line, and they're becoming material risks to the bottom line. And that's what we mean when we say fines. So avoiding fines are all, you know, as an example of the way to save money. So we try to, and it's one of the main findings coming out of the paper, and we'll talk about all top five findings in just a minute. But one of the um, key ones is that it's really important to communicate to to the companies that is in their financial best interest to diversify their proteins. It's not just good to do for the environment and for um, the world as we know it, because a more resilient food system is a better food system for humanity. We all experienced that in COVID. Let's not do that again. So uh, it's, it's a good thing for um, goodwill, if you will, but it's really for the bottom line. Um, and so there's a significant amount of the paper, I want to say 25% dedicated to the science of why plant-based innovation and diversified proteins are better for um, the environment, soil, regenerative agriculture, uh, food insecurity, etc. Maybe you can talk about some of the, the main points of that? Um, well, um, so, I mean, I think that that's often discussed, and um, it's the main point, though. I think, uh, in addition to the details of it, are that this this the subject of plant based innovation has a broad mandate, and uh, and then I'll get into the details some. But like, um, the more um, the more issues you know uh, that are affected by this thing that you want to improve, the better it is for everybody. So. Well um, said. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we went through, um, you know, we, I mean, we went through the climate change aspect, of course, with, um, you know, dramatic um, portion of around 18% of climate gases um, coming from the sector and then how methane is really an effective lever, uh, lever to affect change to the climate in the positive direction within our lifetimes. And that because methane only lasts for around eight years, uh, we can stop methane production or slow it down and have impact in our lifetimes. And and people don't realize that the the, the carbon that is such the focus of the automobile industry that's that's going to be if something that the cl um, plants dealing with for hundreds of years. But in the meantime, we need to have some impact now because we're the the, the warm earth essentially. So I mean that not to uh, I mean we've said it so many times. It's almost like 
you know, are people getting it? I mean, you know, this, is, um, this is like a main point. And, and so the climate affects everybody uh, pretty, to, you know, to different, in different ways as well. So I think that that's a common good that's being affected by companies. Um, and, uh, you know, we also get into biodiversity loss, pollutions, and, um, and really how um, something that maybe people don't realize how materials um, can also uh, contribute climate gases and how much just how much leather affects per, you know, per per unit of leather. And we get into that details and like um, so and we look at the Higgs sustainability uh, guide uh, data on that. Um, so um, I think that the broader environmental impacts are, are, are also here in that. I mean, I feel like I'm going to start just going on a, you know, a spiel on this, really, that may be too much. But uh, I mean, you know, the, the, when people have one more calorie of, of meat, um, an animal product compared to a plant product, they don't realize just the process that it took to get to that, that meat to their table and how many calories and how much land it took and how much water it took. And so there's unintended, it's a classic story of unintended consequences. And so um, with, um, you know, so much, I, 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 you know, just um, the vast majority of farmland is being used to produce the vast minority of calories through meat. And it, it, it's just like, I mean, it's like almost like an 80-20 situation. And, uh, and, and you know, um, so I think that the inefficiency of that system is something that companies are going to that should, are starting to pick up on, and that by diversifying and starting to diversify their proteins, um, they can um, reach financial um, some financial efficiencies that they hadn't uh, realized. Yeah, just to kind of uh, go full circle on this, so a couple stats that you said, and I just want to make sure that I give them source to them. According to the United Nations Environmental Program, 18% of all greenhouse gases come from animal agriculture, the majority of those being methane. So 32% of the world's global methane production comes from animal ag. You just simply will not impact climate change in the time needed if you do not address a number like 32%. Now, the good news there is that, as Dr. Goodman said, methane being the, the more nefarious gas, but having a shorter lifetime. I believe it's 80 years, not eight. I think it's 80 years. So you can impact that and, and see meaningful uh, change. Half-life. Half-life. 8.4 year half-life. Yeah. Oh, 8.4 year half-life. Thank I mean, you. I it out, but I think that that's, that, I mean, that's what it was in the paper that was cited and that, you know, the NASA was saying carbon dioxide, I mean, carbon emissions are hundreds to thousand years in, the, in that. Right, right. And you really won't impact those. That's why fuel alone won't get you there. Fossil fuel alone won't get you there. Um, so that's addressed with scientific backing in the paper, as is um, the inefficiency of the calorie conversion. So for every one calorie of cow, it takes 25 to 35 calories of crops to feed that cow. Well, that means deforesting to grow crops to feed animals. 25 to 35 calories of crop to get one calorie of animal. And then that animal needs land, water, time up. Oh, they need more food. That's more deforestation, more crops, still not feeding that food to people, feeding that food to animals. And they require, you know, 25 times as in the case of a cow, more than 25 times to produce one calorie. It's 16 calories of crops for one calorie of pig, nine for one calorie of chicken. So you see this really inefficient business equation. And when you can shorten your cost of goods sold, you take out that middleman and you do something closer to a one-to-one -one for calorie. And I'm not saying that plant-based innovation is a one-to-one. -one. It depends on what you do. If you eat rice and beans, well, that's a one-to-one. -one. But you know, if you're working on... Um, a hybrid burger of, let's say, cultivated fat and black beans, you know, that's going to be different, but it's not going to be 25 to 35 calories for every one calorie of cow. So there's an inefficiency there. And then um, we do address monocropping. So try to have diversif diversified uh, lentils and beans as cover crops. And then we also address pandemic risk, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to save money on the bottom line by diversifying proteins. And that's the, 
the love language that we use, if you will, to speak to these companies, really how it's going to better their bottom line with the environment as a bonus. Right. In terms of risks, you know, like, so, um, you know, the, uh, the risks of, of, um, pandemic, you know, are real. I mean, you know, it doesn't always translate directly. I mean, but for the companies themselves, it's often offloaded onto the healthcare system and, and everybody's, you know, else's bottom line. Um, but, but I think that, you know, in terms of risks, you know, I don't think, I don't think people are going to stand it for it next time. If there's a, um, if a company comes out with, you know, basically antibiotic resistant strain, I don't think they're going to get a free pass anymore. Uh, and it's interesting, this isn't something we discuss in the paper, but maybe it's another paper in the making. Uh, you know, we're moving into an AI world and with AI, you have advanced technology to reveal transparency within the food supply system, this long, long chain. You know, if you can imagine that you um, go from seed to crop to animal to transportation to finally to human, whereas you could go from seed to human or seed to production to human, you know, so you could shorten that by 60%, 40 to 60%, 40 to 70%. Um, so if you think that that supply chain is going to become very transparent for the consumer, they're going to be able to walk down the grocery store aisle, scan a barcode and see like, oh, these seeds came from um, well-treated workers in Indiana or what have you. Uh, and the flip side is also true. Oh, this came from factory farms with ag gag laws. I, I mean, I just think yeah. an AI world is going to oh, show level, very more yeah, supply chain. Exciting. I mean, the level of people growing, this is growing up. I used to make the mistake when I looked at a, a package, it would say plant number one, three, five, six, that it was from. And I was oh. I, like, is that the actual plant that it came from? You know, um, but in, but as the level of detail and the data increases, you know, the companies will be keeping track of which plant they're going to have records. Um, and they the AI is going to help them find efficiencies in amongst various vendors and in their supply chain to, you know, uh, hopefully replace, um, you know, uh, more expensive products with plant-based ones, which is, yeah, awesome. we talk about it a lot on this show, the carrot and the stick. So AI is both a carrot and a stick AI being the carrot as in showing efficiencies. And that's going to prove to be plant-based innovation, but how to garner those efficiencies with plant-based innovation and the stick. If you don't, then the world gets to see your unattractive and emissions emitting an animal cruelty supply chain. Uh, so uh, back to the paper, a, a solid 25% of it is, is science-backed arguments for, which in, in the end helps those interested in engaging companies uh, with facts and data so that they can communicate with them. And then we move on to a little bit of history and um, some understanding of just stakeholder engagement in general. And for those who may not know, stakeholder engagement is anyone who has an interest in this company, whether they are investor or not. So if the company is polluting in your backyard, you might have an interest and be a stakeholder, even if you're not an investor. Shareholder engagement is investor driven only. So um, this is the stakeholder engagement paper. So it it kind of gives people the general scientific data to move forward for communication, moves into some history, but then quickly gets to case studies. So it goes over six case studies of successful and unsuccessful examples of stakeholder engagement around plant-based innovation and pr pr diversified proteins. Um, we can't hit on all of them in this show, but maybe you have a favorite or maybe you oh, want to yeah. list all six or yeah, you tell me. Yeah, I was really excited about uh, Mighty Earth's case study um, yeah. because Mighty Earth really um, exemplified um, what we are finding to be uh, the best practices. They, they, they use the insider practices of doing shareholder resolutions where uh, they would join other com uh, companies in a shareholder revolt, for example, uh, where they um, um, would, because they own some of the shares and, and they got involved in, um, I believe they own some of the shares, but they got involved in that. And then they also use outsider tactics and they were extremely effective and those uh, proved to be some of the most cost-effective um, and uh, impactful tactics um, when done right. And so, um, you know, just to get into it, like they faced um, a challenge uh, engaging JBS. So, um, you know, over Amazon deforestation and then 
JBS is a very entrenched interest uh, in a way that, in a, because they have very strong relationships with uh, local governments in, in, in Brazil and otherwise. And, um, you know, there's, it, it's like, you know, it's, it, organizations are always slow to act, but when a, when a company is that big and powerful and has that many ties to, to, to policymakers, it's really hard. So, um, so, but Mighty Earth actually made a difference. They were moving the needle. So, um, you know, first of all, um, uh, Glenn Horowitz, uh, who was kind enough to also write a, a foreword for our um, uh, paper, um, you know, he found that JBS and characterized JBS is, uh, quote, the world's largest corporate driver of deforestation and the largest climate polluter by far. The company has a climate footprint as large as Spain's. And this kind of clear language, you know, really, you know, gets through to people, you know, they're not going to want to read as much of the academic kind of stuff. This, this really cuts through and, you know, and so, um, so what he did, uh, was he used a bunch of tactics online or off. He started a campaign with a hashtag stop feeding deforestation. And I really love this example. Um, he, uh, part of this, I mean, it's kind of gruesome, but Part of it was he used a hashtag accompanied by a bloody image of a jaguar speared with a fork, a, a beautiful animal from the Amazon speared with a fork to connect um, what people eat with the damage they cause. And that imagery um, and that campaign led um, uh, European supermarket chains such as Tesco in Britain and Carrefour in, in France. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but Carrefour. Um, and um, it were, they were flooded with emails uh, and customers wanted them to stop selling that. And both of the stores pledged to eliminate meat linked to deforestation from their shel shelves. And, you know, Mighty Earth got that victory. They got that win, but they didn't rest. And they, and, you know, another lesson from the paper was you, you don't give up. You, you know, when, when you have a victory, you, you keep on going, you, you know, you come back. And so they're, they're continuing to push. Um, against JBS's IPO in uh, the U.S., calling it the biggest climate risk IPO, in, uh, climate risk IPO in history. Yeah. So if you don't know Mighty Earth, folks, everybody go to MightyEarth.org right now. Glenn Hurwitz heading that up. A fantastic organization. Um, I'm going to name the other five case studies because this is really the fun part of the paper. It's like a, a mini Netflix show with each case study and story. It's it's really fun and each has a great story. And then I'm going to come back to Mighty Earth and kind of talk about what uh, Sasha is talking about. So um, engine number one has a great success story and you've probably heard of them and as, as kind of the leading advocates in getting change um, with uh the oil industry, but um, read the case study. It's a great one. Then there's the case of Carl Icahn, uh, the, the major investor against McDonald's. I might come back to that one in a second. There's also FAIR and that case study, As You Sow and Their Work Against Antimicrobial Resistance and the Humane Society of the United States against Tyson. That's got a little twist to it. These really are independent like stories. These are independent films, the way they play. I and mean, that, that story kind of has a twist to it. It wasn't successful. And then it came back from, from behind and it was successful. So you want to download the paper and read that. And then Mighty Earth, uh, by the way, to download this free paper, you would go to vegtechinvest.com forward slash white paper. Uh, so coming back to Mighty Earth, let's use this example, because this is really where um, you get the top five things to do in stakeholder engagement. And Mighty Earth did them all. And that's why they were so successful. So first of all, they or maybe you want to say it, um, Dr. Goodman, but uh, what, what would be step number one? Um, well, I mean, it was pretty clear they wanted them to stop deforesting. Um, I mean, um, so clear objectives to have a really clear objective and a clear goal of what you're doing and something that is communicable easily to others. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, that was an example of um, it being really clear, you know, stop doing this deforestation. Um, you know, you can also propose to company metrics that if it's something more complicated, you know, like reduce deforestation by X amount and this and that. Yeah. So something, have a very clear and tangible goal and have a clear 
way of getting there. So um, if you're organizing a large group of people, and that would be the goal, that's one of the learnings, don't go it alone. You want to you want to engage a lot of people to go together against an organization. Um, maybe the word against isn't the right word to go to an organization asking for change. You want a large group of people, but you have to have someone at the helm. You have to have a clear and understandable goal, and you have to have a roadmap for getting there that everyone can understand. That's the group part, uh, or I should say the, the organizing, the idea of organizing the group, haven't gotten to the group yet. But then you're going to go to the company, and just don't waste your time here. Translate it to money. Would you agree, Dr. Goodman? Yeah, I mean, you want to, uh, you want to, you want to translate into the bottom line and basically stakeholders, right away. stakeholders um, you know, exactly. You want to show the risks or, and the rewards, um, the carrot, the stick. Yeah. So the carrot here is get your better bottom line. The stick, which is what we're going to talk about. Number three is what's going to happen to you if you don't. <laughs> so number three is don't go it alone and get a very large group of people together. And I would say, well, we don't name it this way in the paper, start slowly. It doesn't have to be acrimonious. Maybe they're going to very easily see the financial argument and start to make changes. And then it would be enough just to start internal dialogues with the shareholders, the board of directors, and those stakeholders who are interested. Maybe a letter writing campaign is, is a nice, easy way to just start the dialogue and get it going. And then you escalate, as Mighty Earth did, with their gory imagery and their uh, strong hashtags and their garnering social media and they're going for the press. When JBS, which is quite entrenched and, and um, very friendly with the Brazilian government, getting lots of support from them, uh, hard to move them when they've got emissions as big as Spain. If they didn't move right away and they didn't, then they expanded to that stick and they had a large enough group of people going for it that they could extend that very understandable message on social media and everyone got it. Right, exactly. And um, they they had a, a, a grassroots um, diverse coalition that, that kind of naturally formed around this it spread like a wildfire um they had i mean they had that touch to get that that wildfire going so i think that's kind of an interesting point you see something that starts um in the beginning as let's say not being grassroots you know it starts with uh, mighty earth having a direct intention a very simple goal that's easily um communicated to others and then also has a step-by-step -step plan to what to do you know, how we start and if we don't get what we want, how do we um, escalate, et cetera. So um, does it have to be grassroots? Do, is, like, what do you think there? It doesn't. And, um, you know, uh, you know, um, negative events, you know, ne these negative um, pressure pressures that they, that's characteristic of what they do isn't necessarily the case for all advocacy. I mean, uh, a lot of um, very powerful interests will um, work more like uh, with the companies. So for FAIR, for example, I don't want to you know, characterize them as negative at all. They, they actually collaborate a lot um, with a large shareholder network, a stakeholder network of over uh, $7 uh, trillion, which is one, they're one of the fastest growing coalitions, and they work with companies to try to change them. So. Uh, and um, and so uh, they they send them letters, they interviews, they they go inside and and I think um, many in the industry just aren't aware of how much fair does and I I, I think that it's like kind of like um, they might be taken for granted a little bit. Just I think they they do a lot and um, and so it doesn't have to be negative. Like I think though a coalition that's diverse can have specialists like Mighty Earth doing what they do best and what they're known for and what they have the gift for and then having you know, a member like fair doing what they do best and work inside uh yes i would agree with that different organizations are going to approach it differently but i think these top findings still remain true no matter what kind of feeling your organization has and that is um 
direct and clear goals up front. Always make it financially meaningful to the company with whom you're uh, discussing these changes. I apologize for um, the construction that has suddenly taken place outside my front door, everyone. Uh, getting large groups together, escalating as appropriate, and then, as Mighty Earth did, keeping the pressure on. So they have not given up on JBS, and you see them taking on JBS now uh, with the New York Stock Exchange, I believe, in the United States. Uh, yeah, that's right. They're they're they've been pushing back against JBS having its um, U.S. IPO. I mean, that's JBS is listed in um, in Brazil, I believe. But they, you know, they're pushing back on them coming to our house and just basically, um, you know, just showing that this the, the risks that are involved to to climate. I mean, um, so. So I think that, um, you know, they're working on the inside as much as they can through whatever mechanism will help them reach their goal. And they're very pragmatic about it. Yeah, um, I do hope everyone will download the paper vegtechinvest.com slash white paper. Okay, but it's not all rosy and success stories. So uh, the corporate raider Carl Icahn went up against McDonald's. On animal welfare issues, he was not a big shareholder of McDonald's, but with just a small amount of money, and, and we go into this in the papers, I think it's very important um, to recognize that, like Dr. Goodman said, we consider this a blueprint and a guide and a living document, so it will be updated about every six months, that, that takes people through not just the best steps, but the bureaucratic and administrative things that must be done to... Um, escalate to a shareholder um, engagement uh, if if it comes to that, which would mean um, filing a resolution and what filing would entail. So I believe uh, Carl Icahn went and tried to get the board to replace two board members because he didn't like McDonald's philosophy on how it treated pregnant pigs, mother pigs, uh, and the conditions that they were in and that they were not allowed to stand up or turn around. And he considered this cruel and inhumane, as does everyone else. Uh, and he failed. So why did he fail? I mean, who has more power than Carl Icahn? Right. And uh, I guess this is where, um, I don't know. I, I mean, this is where, you know, in the intentionality of a single person and their power and their will comes against organizations and groups and so you know he's he uh he had a small share in the company and uh so of course he's not going to win a vote in the company there's just it's like and that's not how voting works um but he he did raise a lot of awareness um of the issue in the public and uh he he kind of put pressure on McDon uh, McDonald's at the time and um, uh, drew a lot of attention to this issue. And so the lesson here is, um, you know, if you're going to, I don't know, if you're going to come to, a, you know, a, a gunfight, don't bring a knife or something like that. But it was just, you know, he, he, you need a diverse coalition to face a big organization because, you you know, there's, there's so much you can do and like what, what we did when we studied Carl Icahn's case is we looked at his failure to learn so you don't have to do that you can like uh we could you know there are lots of failures out there um and um you know one of the mottos i think in um in business i've heard is to fail harder and so you don't have to if you just read this paper and you read what other people did when they failed so and in fact i wouldn't even characterize it as a total failure yeah I, actually, yeah i love that you say that because in the end while Carl Icahn was not successful with McDonald's and he was not able to replace those two board seats with his preferred people, it did get a lot of press. And according to Sustainable Investing Initiative, I apologize, I've got, got that wrong, SI2, Sustainable uh, Investing Initiative, I, I believe, um, since Carl Icahn went up against McDonald's, there have been more shareholder resolutions filed on animal welfare behalf since that happened about two years ago. So it opened the doors and it, it sort of <clears throat> was a bit of a permission, if you will, to go to companies based on uh, this desire for change, which ultimately also does come back to the bottom line. So um, everything can be turned into a bottom line issue. Um, but now it's more of an accepted issue for shareholder resolutions. 
it is and it was uh there was some growing momentum outside of him as well and in, in um in in, in, in um, courts i believe but you know and I, I think that it's become pretty much um an issue that, that is repeatedly seen as uh coming up about you know animal welfare and in um in especially gestation crates yes it is um prop 12 in fact which passed, I believe, in 2018 in California, which said that pigs needed a certain amount of space in their crate to be able to stand up and turn around. And this would mean that factories would need to reconfigure their space and, and their crates. Uh, that was taken to court. And as of January 1st, 2024, it has been upheld and um, been in installed, if you will, uh, in January 1st of 2024. So um, Prop 12 was kind of a precursor to what Carl Icahn was pushing McDonald's to do. And then again, even though he didn't have success and he skipped a bunch of steps, he had clear objectives, but he didn't really turn it into financial dialogue with the company. And he certainly didn't uh, get a big crowd behind him. And he wasn't able to really keep the pressure on. But just in that he was out there, he had success for others, led the way for others. Now, the Humane Society of the United States also was not successful against Tyson, but they used their threat of filing a shareholder resolution, which can get a lot of publicity, like Carl Icahn's got a lot of publicity. Um, they used that threat to then negotiate with Tyson out of the public eye. So even though they were not successful immediately in filing any kind of resolution for change, they were able to negotiate without having to go that far. So the, the white paper talks about the different steps of escalating. Um, if you want to take it just to gentle um, d discussions and letter writing to kind social media, to extreme social media, to shareholder resolution proposals uh, that garner lots of praise or criticism. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the paper and the end of this podcast. Uh, there, Not everything is rosy, though. So um, there are roadblocks. And what are some of the tactics that companies can use to kind of stall the whole process? Um, well, I think this is actually an area you know a lot about, too, is um, public relations I wanted to focus on a little bit. Um, I mean, of course, before I get to that, I'll just say, you know, organizations are often slow to make changes anyhow. And so they're going to say, oh, we're just going to experiment with this. And, um, you know, they may, you know, concede to um, outsiders and try something but they won't really give it the chance it needs. And so, um, you know, uh, I think that, um, for example, for companies to really um, give a product a chance, it's gonna take uh, more, um, more than the time that they often give it. Um, so with products like uh, plant-based products, for example, they're gonna need to give it more time, we think, than, um, than it, than it uh, than they would want to necessarily because it, it, you have to build out an audience. You have to find the right match between the right audience and learn how to engage with them. Um, and so things take time. So companies will give up oftentimes. Um, but just going to PR, I think that, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, there's a section on the Center for Consumer Freedom. And, um, you know, I think that that's a really interesting one and in that, um, you know, we have uh, pretty much like organized resistance. There's like, um, if we aren't advocating for plant-based and protein, diversica protein diversification, someone will be pushing the other way, uh, whether it's vendors or it's PR, it's, there's going to be a vacuum. So it's almost like a, I feel like it's almost a requirement for us to use our voice to uh, talk directly to these companies. And so um, and an example of some of the pushback is from, the PR um, industry is from uh, the Center for Consumer Freedom and uh, Rick Behrman. And there's a section on the kinds of tactics that they use to really turn an issue that may be, you know, complicated into something that's usually very simple uh, for, and that people pick up on that often um, attacks the messenger instead of dealing with the message. And so I think that that kind of, uh, that's the kind of tactic that um, we, we've seen uh, in the past um, 
and and it, we, we go into it a little bit and um we outline you know um the super bowl ad that uh, the center for consumer freedom put out against plant-based meats is a major ad that we think um helped kind of um change the the tune um and how impossible foods then came out with their counter ad and 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 i i just so i don't want to ruin it i want to give too many spoilers but um i think it's a good section um in that um you know the the impossible the impossible really was highlighting some some negative things in their in their rejoinder to the ccf that you know i think it's it's a it's a fun section of the paper that'll probably have you laughing so um, again, kind of following up on what Dr. Goodman's saying, so there are many tactics that are employed um, to water down what kind of change can take place. So some of these tactics end up showing up in things like saying that they'll try a product and then they really just don't give it enough time to um, take hold. So sort of short shrifting the effort, if you will or saying that they're going to do something and then they simply don't. So agreeing to the changes and then never implementing them, which is why step number five of the learnings is to keep the pressure on, or to obfuscate the issue at hand and just confuse the consumer. So that's where something like the Center for Consumer Freedom, which has historically backed the tobacco industry and now backs the Cattle Ranchers Association, the meat industry, really just goes after the messenger, attacks the messenger as they have done with Beyond Meat, for example, uh, tries to put out misinformation, misinformation campaigns, really confusing the consumer who doesn't have time to do a PhD research study on chicken nuggets and really what are they and what's good and what's bad. And so you can't ask the single mother of three to have to make this uh, nuclear science experiment in her own kitchen. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, um, diverting people from understanding the real problems at hand. So there is a large section on the Center for Consumer Freedom as an example of what kind of PR can take place to thwart any change by confusing the consumer and then going at the messenger with an anti-campaign on social media. So be careful because social media, of course, is a double-edged sword. So that's also a very interesting read, I have to say. Again, if you would like the paper, it is on vegtechinvest.com slash white paper. Um, any final words from you on the paper that you would like to share? Um, you know, I think that um, I think it, it's really important for people to try to change organizations in the most effective way possible. And I think without an understanding of the strategies outlined in this paper, it's going to be difficult. Like, you, you know, there are a lot of options available for that may be, uh, in, turn, in your case, the most effective. And um, so, so I think that um, this is the kind of thing that has to be done, essentially, it's almost like, you know, you have to work to change the industry to grow it. I couldn't agree more. You have to work to change the industry to grow it. That sounds like a quote I can use. Um, yes, I would like to really reiterate that um, we're talking about some of the juicy stories here, but not all change has to be acrimonious. There can be some very swift and efficient changes made just through simple letter writing campaigns. But the point is, sometimes the industry needs education, which is why at least 25% of this paper is on the science-backed data. Uh, sometimes the industry just needs education itself. They're quite busy and they just don't have all of the facts about how this could better their business bottom line and their uh, carbon footprint and how they have a great sustainability story to tell. So there's a carrot uh, by diversifying their proteins and any effort to do that would be again in their financial best interest. So um, depending on your organization and how you'd like to move forward, it's better for the planet and a goodwill move, but it's also better for the industry as a whole and business as, as we know it, as we try to grow the industry. So um, we leave you on that positive note. I would just like to say, and quickly, let me do this if I can. I would like to say thank you to students Ryan Chung, Masha Gegushadze, gosh, I hope I got that right, Kira Trailer, Gloria Natali Maldonada, 
Maldonado, excuse me, Benjamin Morris. Also, huge thank you to Mighty Earth, which did a forward, FinPublica, which did a forward, and Verity Platform, which is a platform for signing stakeholder engagements. In fact, VegTech Invest has a stakeholder engagement right now on the Verity Platform. Again, you can go to VegTechInvest.com. And go to a tab in the about or more section that has uh, stakeholder engagements on them. So you can sign up for our protein diversification stakeholder engagement using the principles that we put forth in the study. We have our own stakeholder engagement going on right now, a letter writing campaign. So you can easily electronically, without a lot of effort, maybe taking you 30 seconds, sign up on that. And that's one example of how a very friendly and easy gesture to get stakeholder engagement um, wheels turning so that companies diversify their proteins. Sasha, any last words for you before we are over and out today? Um, no, I, I think that that pretty much sums it up. Just, um, you know, just it, it, it takes a lot of work uh, uh, to, to change an organization. But like I said, like, you know, you have to change this industry to grow it. So I'll, I'll stick with that. Yeah, you really do. And the benefits there is that, you know, once some companies start diversifying their proteins for a better business bottom line and a better carbon footprint, others will be forced to do the same to stay competitive in the industry. So the initial work, it's sh stakeholder engagement has large payoffs because then it starts to just happen organically. So really encourage everyone to download the stakeholder engagement white paper for protein innovation, plant-based innovation and diversified proteins. It can be found at vegtechinvest.com slash white paper. Everyone, thank you for sharing this podcast. When you're on iTunes, go ahead and give it a five-star review. It really does matter. Uh, Dr. Sasha Goodman, don't go away, but everybody else on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter X, I will see you all next week. Bye, everybody.